All right, today we're continuing learning about integrals. Uh, there's plenty to learn about integrals that uh, we could just keep going and going. In fact, calculus two in large part continues learning more and more about integrals, including more applications than we will have time for. But let's keep on with it here. Um, first thing I wanna do is I wanna reemphasize the, both the geometric meaning of integrals um, as well as the fundamental theorem of calculus in kind of a, you might call it a strange way, but kind of cool at the same time. Let's consider the graph of the function y equals square root of one minus, I'm gonna call the independent variable t here, square root of one minus t squared. Let's graph that in a plane labeled with the axes uh, axes being labeled t and y. This is something you should recognize actually as being a graph which is the upper half of the unit circle. Say about like this. Why? Well, if you square both sides, you get y squared is one minus t squared. And if you add t squared to both sides, that's the same as t squared plus y squared equals one. Usually you see that equation is x squared plus y squared equals one. That would be the equation of the unit circle in the x, y plane. I'm purposely picking my independent variable to, to be t because I'm gonna use the letter x for something else here. That's still the equation of the unit circle. Why is it just the upper half? Well, in going back this way, we're just taking the positive square root. So we gotta get outputs that are above the axis. If I took the negative square root, then it would go below. It would be the lower half of the unit circle. I want to pick X to be, say, some positive number between zero and one. Say right there. And I would like to figure out the integral of this function of T square root of one minus T squared over the interval from zero to X. In other words, I want to figure out this area right here. Okay. I'm purposely leaving X as an unknown, as a variable in a sense. So the answer will depend on X. You get this? X is some arbitrary number between zero and one. The answer to this integral better depend on X. Now, you might be looking at this and saying, how in the world am I going to do this? Do I need to find an antiderivative of square root of one minus t squared? You, you could, but that would take a lot of guessing and guessing that would most likely take a long time to figure out. In fact, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to derive an antiderivative of this by thinking about areas. It equals the area of this region up here that's shaded right there, whatever that area happens to be, can we figure out what it is? Because this happens to be a semicircle, you actually can. If you draw a line in here between the origin and this point right there, we have broken up that area into two pieces. One piece is a right triangle right here. And one piece is, well, you could call it a piece of pie, piece of pizza. The official name is a sector of a circle where this angle does depend on what X is, right? If, if X were bigger, that would be a bigger angle. Let's call the angle theta. We're probably gonna have to figure out how theta depends on X and ultimately how the area depends on X from this. I hope you remember from geometry that when you've got two parallel lines like this line here and this line here, and you got some line crossing them, that alternate interior angles are congruent. Do you remember that? This angle theta is the same as this angle. This is also theta right there. which is gonna allow me to use a right triangle 
that right triangle right there as well. So let's break this area into two pieces. It's the area of the triangle, the right triangle, plus the area of that sector of the circle. The area of a triangle is easy, one half base times height. What's the base of this triangle right here? How does it depend on X? The answer is very simple. What's the base of that triangle that I'm pointing at? If that number right there is X, what's this length? It's also X, yeah. That's the base. What's the height? What's this distance? Well, it's gotta be related to the purple graph, who's, which has equation equal to this. If you plug in T equals X, that'll be the height. Square root of one minus X squared. That's the height. Okay, what about the area of the slice of pizza here? Well, you got to know something. The area of the slice of pizza, slice a sector of a circle is one half pi times the angle in radians. You ever heard that before? One half pi times the angle in radians is the area of a sector of a circle. Does that make sense? <clears throat> well, what if we run around the whole circle? then the angle would be two pi. One half times pi times two pi is pi. Oops, I made a mistake. Get rid of that pi. One half theta where theta is in radians is what I meant to say. If theta is two pi, then this becomes pi. Area of a circle of radius one. If theta is pi, in other words, 180 degrees, half a circle, the area is pi over two. This only works for the unit circle. If, if my circle has radius r, I also have to multiply by r squared. But r, r is one here. The radius of the circle is one. That makes sense. One half theta, where theta is measured in radians, is the area of that circle. But wait a minute. I got to figure out how this depends on x. There is no theta in that symbol there. How does theta depend on x? Well, look at the triangle. I could use Sokotoa, sine or cosine or tangent. Is one of them easier than the other? Uh, so probably sine might be easiest to think about. Look at this right triangle here. The sine of that angle in that right triangle, the angle right here is opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite side has length X. What's the hypotenuse have length equal to? What's the distance right there? It's the unit circle, its radius is one. Hey, sine of theta equals X. In other words, theta is inverse sine of X. Or arc sine if you prefer. I guess this integral equals the sum. Weird. Is it true? Is that right? Let me give this a name. Let me call it capital F of X. This should be an antiderivative of little f. The derivative of capital F should be this function with an X in place of T, the integrand right there. 
That would be the fundamental theorem of calculus. Let's see if it is, if the derivative is right. What's f prime of x? It's like a gateway problem here. Differentiate this with the product rule. The derivative of one half x is one half. So that's the derivative of the first function times the second function, plus the first function times the derivative of the second, the derivative of square root of one minus x squared by the chain rule would be this right there. Double check that in your mind. There's the first function. There's the derivative of the second square root of one minus x squared is one minus x squared to the one half power. Bring down the one half, subtract one from the exponent, differentiate the, find the derivative of the inside function, which would be negative two x. Wait a minute, don't forget about the derivative of inverse sine. That's a memorized one with a one half in front. It would be one over two square root of one minus x squared. This evidently, if I haven't made a mistake, should simplify to this function with an x instead of a t. Let's see if it does. Let's get a common denominator, denominator of two square root of one minus x squared. This term already has a two in the bottom. Put a square root of one minus x squared in the bottom by multiplying this expression by square root of one minus x squared over square root of one minus x squared. These two things are equal. This one already has a, the correct denominator because you got a two down there. I canceled one of the two factors of two there. And I've got a negative one half power. And I've got an x squared up top. And then finally, this one has already got the right denominator. <coughs> now combine these fractions. They all have the same denominator, so we can just com combine the numerators. One plus one is two. Negative x squared minus x squared is negative two x squared. And if you know your algebra, you realize this is working. This is the square root of one minus x squared. In a couple spots here, I use the fact that a number to the one half power is the same as that number divided by the number to the one half power. I use that a couple spots here, right? Because you can subtract the exponents, one minus one half. I used it to see these are equal. And I used it to see that these two things are equal. But you gotta be good at algebra to know that kind of thing. It worked. This function again, right here, we found by finding the area under the graph, but it is also an antiderivative of the integrand function right there. If you use X instead of T. Capital F prime of X equals little f of X for all X in the domain. The domain is the interval from negative one to one. Kind of a tricky problem, but uh, kind of cool to see it work out nicely. And it is emphasizing the truth of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay. It's also emphasizing the area under the curve interpretation. It'd be hard to figure this out without doing the areas, right? That'd be a hard answer to guess. And it is the same as f of capital F of X minus capital F of zero as well. The same as that. 
because if you plug in zero here, you get zero. Capital F of zero is zero. This is the same as capital F of X minus capital F of zero. So it is matching the fundamental theorem of calculus. X is arbitrary, but I could pick something specific for X as well. Our main application today that I want to focus on is to, uh, well, you could say it's application to probability. You could say it's application to statistics. You could also say it's applications to data science. All those things are really related to each other. I'm mostly going to focus on the probability interpretation of what I'm going to show you. I'm going to talk about probability density functions. Sometimes just called density functions for short. PDFs or just density functions for short. DFs. <clears throat> and their cumulative distribution functions. This is our last main application for the course. So there are other kinds of problems that we'll look at some today that you should be able to handle in the last homework assignment due Monday as well. Cumulative distribution functions are sometimes called CDFs. <clears throat> what is a probability density function? A PDF is a function that integrates to one over its domain and is never negative as well. Never negative in value. The graph never goes below the axis. It's implicit here that it's a PDF probability density function for something called a continuous random variable. This is a probability topic here. Now you've probably learned a little bit about probability in the past. Some people love probability, some people hate probability. My youngest daughter who you met, you know, earlier in the semester, she loves math and she likes calculus, but she says, dad, I don't like probability. What kind of probability have you learned in the past? Probably things about that are related to permutations and combinations, rolling dice, flipping coins, that kind of thing. This is a different kind of subject within probability. Continuous random variables. These are quantities that are, well, first of all, random. That's why they call random variables. And secondly, they take on values in a continuum. Examples include lengths, areas, amount of time. Let's focus on an amount of time application. What would be an example? Um, maybe you decide you want to sit in a lawn chair at an intersection and just count cars as they come through the intersection. Maybe you count how many cars come through the intersection in an hour. Maybe you also, you've got a stopwatch on your phone or whatever, and you, uh, you time how long it takes for the next car to arrive. One car goes through, maybe it takes another 15 seconds before the next car gets there. It goes through, the, maybe it takes another 7.2 seconds for the next car to go through. It goes through the intersection, maybe it takes another 8.34 seconds for the next car to go through. The amount of time that you have to wait until the next car goes through would be an example of a continuous random variable and the continuity 
refers to the fact that you can measure the amount of time to an arbitrary degree of precision if you've got a good enough measuring instrument. The amount of time can take on a value in a continuum. Let's take an example. This example we actually did before. Say f of x is some constant over x squared. I think we did this maybe on Monday or something. C over x squared, or if you prefer, C times x to the negative two. And let's take the domain to be, I forgot what it did on Monday. Was it one to two or one to three? I don't remember. Oh, let's pick one to three. There's the domain. I've got to choose the value of C so that this integrates to one. must choose C so that the integral of f of x over the entire domain equals one. Not any old C will do. C has to be something specific. You should be able to do this kind of problem, whether on homework or maybe Monday's quiz, or when next Wednesday's exam, you should be able to solve for the value C that makes this work. How? Well, go ahead and do the integral. It's a property of integrals that you can bring the constant out in front, right? That's, a, that's one of the properties of integrals, linearity. To do the actual integral though, You've got to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. You need an antiderivative of x to the negative two. That takes a little bit of experimentation to figure out. One antiderivative is negative x to the negative one. And you can always check your answer. If you differentiate this, what happens? You'd bring down that negative one, it would cancel with that negative sign to give you plus x to the negative two, it would give you that engram bit. But the fundamental theorem of calculus says to evaluate this from one to three. That notation means first plug in three, then subtract what you get when you plug in one. And be careful about your minus signs. Simplify now, this is the same as negative one third, and this is the same as plus one. One minus a third is two thirds. Set this equal to one, because I want my PDF to integrate to one over the domain. So for C, that means C must be three halves. Yeah, this is the same example we did before. 1.5. So we have chosen C. Therefore, F of X, we've chosen C to make this function three halves over X squared, or if you prefer three over two X squared, or three halves X to the negative two power, that's gonna be a PDF for x between the one and three. And here's, the, here's what you use it for. You use it to find probabilities. How? By integrating it over whatever domain you're interested in. For example, although it's gotta be a subdomain of this one, I might wonder what is the probability, PR stands for probability, that my variable is between, let's say, oh, um, two and 2.75. This is a symbol that stands for the probability, the probability that X is between 
Traditional will make the, the X here, by the way, a capital X, make it big. That's a traditional notation for random variables. But X is between two and 2.27, excuse me, 2.75, which by the way, as a fraction would be um, 11 fourths. <clears throat> The way you find this probability is you integrate the probability density function, the PDF, over the interval. The answer is going to be the integral of f of x from 2 to 2.75. That's how you find the probability. I'm just telling you that's how you find it. I'll explain why that's how you find it here in a few minutes. Let's write it as 11 fourths here. The function is three halves, that's the C, X to the negative two. Compute that antiderivative. By guessing. Try to guess a function whose derivative is three halves X to the negative two. Hmm. How about negative three halves X to the negative one? That takes experiment experience to be able to guess that. Really what I'm using is I'm using the reverse of the power rule here when I do the guessing. Remember, this is a side calculation. Remember that the derivative of X to the N is N times X to the N minus one. You bring the N down and subtract one from the X point. That also, by the way, means that the integral of X to the N if you reverse the process, is x to the n plus one over n plus one plus c? Well, at least as, as long as I'm not dividing by zero there, as long as n is not equal to negative one. How do you check this? Differentiate this. You'd have to bring down the n plus one in front, and then the n plus one would cancel with this n plus one and you subtract one from the exponent, n plus one minus one is n. It gives you the integrand. This is a rule that you can always use, including on the quiz for next Monday and next Wednesday's exam. You can use this rule. I'm applying it here with n equal to um, negative two. Compare these two, ignore the three halves. If n is negative two, then this gives me, well, negative two plus one is negative one. X to the negative one over negative one. That's what I've got here, X to the negative one, and the minus sign in front is like dividing by negative one. But the three halves is there, so it needs to be here as well. But you can check this by differentiation. You can always check it. This is evaluated from two to 11 fourths. So first plug in 11 fourths, then subtract what you get when you plug in two. These two minus signs make a plus sign. Looks like this term here is gonna become three fourths. Two to the negative one is the same as one half. 11 fourths to the negative one power is the same as four elevenths. Four elevenths times three halves, what will that be? Um, six elevenths. Hopefully I didn't make a mistake there. Get a common denominator of 44. It'll be 33 minus 24 over 44. It looks like the answer is nine over 44. about 0 0.2045. About a 20% probability that your variable is between two and 2.75. That's what this calculation verifies. Now, when would you ever do this kind of thing? To tell you the truth all the time, people use probability models, not necessarily this particular one, but ones like it in spirit all the time, including 
perhaps most prominently, actuaries in the insurance industry. They are very much interested in probabilities. Like how long is this dishwasher gonna last, for example? Or how long will this person live? Or how long before this house goes on fire, right? Insurance is about dealing with bad events, deaths, breakdowns, fires, hurricanes, earthquakes. But it's important, right? If we didn't have insurance, well, our society wouldn't function. And again, I'm not saying this particular model would be necessarily a useful model, though it could be. But ones like it can be certainly very useful. Let me emphasize the intuitive meaning of stuff here by doing something in Mathematica here that, well, it's kind of fancy. You don't need to understand this, but I think it'll be worth doing. Mathematica can be used to do simulations with probability, but I usually have to look up examples to remember how to do it. The key command is called probability distribution. And we can just copy and paste and modify the examples here. <clears throat> so what goes here in this spot is the probability density function. In our case, that's three over two X squared. What goes here is the domain. I don't want minus infinity to infinity. I want one to three. I can enter this and seemingly nothing happens when I enter it. However, something did happen. You just don't see any output. It has stored some things in its memory. And one thing it stored is the formula for the PDF. Three over two X squared when one is, X is between one and three and zero otherwise. And I can, for example, integrate this PDF from two to 11 fourths. The D here just stands for distribution. Don't worry about it. To get the answer that I just got, 944. Yep, 944. That answer is supposed to represent the probability that a randomly chosen number from this distribution, in other words, that an observed value of the random variable is between two and 2.75, the chances is 944, it's about a 20% chance. And this can be confirmed if you do a simulation. What kind of simulation am I talking about? I need to look that up as well. I think I need to use the probability here. Um, <clears throat> maybe that's not what I'm looking for. Oh, I think it's I think it's called random variate. Random variate. Again, you don't need to know this, but it is a cool application, I think, in Mathematica. <clears throat> if I copy and paste this D in here, and let's change this to a 10 instead of 10 to the fourth, this will generate 10 random data values from this distribution. And let's get rid of the semicolon so we see the output. There they are. According to this probability model, about 20% of them should be between two and 2.75. Now with only 10 data points, that means the number between two and 2.75 could be, it should be near two. But it conceivably could be zero, one, two, three, or four. I, I wouldn't expect it to be five or greater. Which of these is between two and 2.75? It looks like one, two, three, four of the numbers are, 40% of them. Let's do more than, than 10 data points. Let's do 100 data points. How many of these are between two and 2.75? It should be in the ballpark of 20 of them, 20%. Well, let's go ahead and count them. 
None of the ones in the first row. Here's one. Here's a second one. Two, I'm looking between two and 2.75. Third one here. Fourth one, fifth one. Sixth. Uh, seventh. Eighth. Uh, ninth. Uh, this one close enough, maybe to call count that as a tenth. Close enough. Uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Close enough to count that 17. Okay. These things are not perfect. These things are simulations. And in fact, if I re enter this, I'll get different data though it's all following this probability model. What does the probability model represent intuitively? If you plot this PDF function for x between one and three, it looks like that. Intuitively, what's going on is the fact that the graph is higher when x is close to one and lower when x is close to three means your data are going to be clustered on the lower end. That's why this is a density. The higher the output of this function is, the more dense the data is. So when you look at these 100 numbers, a lot more of them are pretty close to one than are close to three. Not very many of these are real close to three. But there are a lot that are pretty close to one. Do you see that? 1.1 is pretty close to one. 1.01 is pretty close to one. 1 1.04, 1 1.02, 1.04. There's a lot of numbers pretty close to one, but very few very close to three. What's the largest value here? Uh, that's getting somewhat close to three. Here's a bit larger. Hmm, that might be the largest. That might be the one the closest to three right there. A couple above 2.9 here, but not very many, not compared to how many are close to one. And again, these things are constructed so that the area under the graph equals the probability that you're after. What about these corresponding? Cumulative distribution functions, CDFs. CDFs are antiderivatives of PDFs. We compute probabilities using PDFs by computing their integrals. But if a CDF is an antiderivative of a PDF, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, I can just compute a difference. How does that work out in this example? Again, the little f of x is, again, the c is 3 halves, 3 halves over x squared, which can also be written as 3 over 2x squared, or 3 halves x to the negative 2, again, when x goes between 1 and 3. A CDF is an antiderivative of this. But not just any old antiderivative, it's got to be a special antiderivative. Let's first find the most general antiderivative. Let's do an indefinite integral. In fact, we've already done this. This is going to be negative 3 halves x to the negative 1 plus c. You can always check that by differentiation. I'll call this capital F of x. It's an antiderivative of little f. But again, I don't want just any old antiderivative. I want its value at the left end point of the domain to be zero. That's how the CDF is chosen, so that the value at the left end point is zero. So I need to plug in x equals one and set that equal to zero and solve for c. I get three halves times one to the negative one plus c. That's the same as c minus three halves. And therefore, 
D minus three halves is zero, therefore C equals three halves. Happens to be the same as, uh, this is a capital C, happens to be the same as the lowercase C from the other page, but that's not always gonna happen. Okay, it happened to be the same thing as this C was, three halves. But that's just a coincidence. Okay, it won't always be the same. So the capital F of X, the, this cumulative distribution function is negative three halves X to the negative one plus, uh, plus three halves. Or if you prefer, um, three halves minus three over two X. Another way to write that is to get a common denominator of 2x to write it as 3x minus 3 over 2x. Those are all okay ways to write the CDF. If you graph this for x between 1 and 3, it's got the property that its value at the left endpoint is 0 and its value at the right endpoint will be 1. What does the graph look like? It is an antiderivative of little f. Capital F prime of x equals little f of x, which was three over two x squared, whose graph looked like this. In other words, this graph is telling you the slopes of this graph that I'm trying to draw. The slope starts out pretty high and gets smaller. So the graph over here has got to look something about like this. And because of the fundamental theorem of calculus, the way you find probabilities with the CDF, such as the probability that X is between two and 2.75, are you calculate differences of values, F of 2.75 minus F of two, F of 11 force capital F minus, oh, this is a one, oh, no, excuse me, that's a two. Sorry. Capital F of 11 force minus capital F of two. And if you do that and check your answer carefully, you'll get the same answer as before, 940 force. Okay. Really important application of calculus here. I think it's worth introducing these ideas in first semester calculus. I will re-emphasize these ideas next Monday as well. For our remaining time today, I think it would be good to go back to the parametric curve motion examples and emphasize concepts there. Well, maybe before we do that, I should emphasize a few more things. And maybe, maybe we should wait on that actually. Let's wait on that until next Monday. In our remaining time today, let's look at homework type problems that emphasize yet more things about integrals. Our main application so far has been to physics. If you integrate the speed, you get the distance traveled. If you integrate the velocity, you get the change in position, right? You remember that? Also called displacement. And now if we if we we can use we can find PDFs to model probabilities, and we can also integrate them to find these CDFs that can also model probabilities. But there's other kinds of applications you should be able to think about. And you it's helpful to think about units. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of these problems in section 5.3. Number one says if f of t is measured in dollars per year and t is measured in years, what are the units of the integral? And you might also ask, what does the integral represent? So f of t, this is section 5.3, number one. F of T is measured, it's a function that somehow represents a quantity that is in dollars per year. 
what kind of function are we talking about here? This would be an example of a, a financial flow. What is a financial flow? It's a function that would model how fast money is moving, how fast money is flowing. What do you mean? Like throw the money in a stream and then watch it flow? No, I don't mean that. I mean flowing from one person's bank account, say to another person's bank account, or maybe from one country's monetary supply to another country's, or maybe one company's money to another one's like Amazon, okay? Right, Amazon's so huge, money is flowing into Amazon's coffers every second of every day at a certain rate, sometimes faster than others. In fact, I think I just saw an article that emphasizes that Amazon makes like a million dollars a minute. And if that's true, a million dollars a minute, what does that convert to every second? Divided by 60, what would that be? Somewhere in the ballpark of sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars $17,000 every second. But sometimes it'd be larger than that, and sometimes it'd be smaller. Sometimes it might be $20,000 a second. Sometimes it might be $10,000 a second. They also have a lot of expenses. They're paying out money as well. Those are examples of financial flows. This one's in dollars per year, but you could measure things in like millions of dollars per second if you're talking about a company like Amazon. When you look at this symbol, the integral, it is sometimes helpful to think of before you write the integral symbol to write the integrand as f of t dt. And to pretend that that's a multiplication, even though it's technically not, right? We do this pretending in calculus sometimes. Why? Well, because the pretending is, is a helpful conceptual tool, tool sometimes. I could pretend, so this is my financial flow in dollars per year. And I could pretend DT is a small amount of time in years. And then I could pretend this is a product. And if I pretend it's a product, the years cancel, giving me a quantity in dollars. And then when you integrate that, the integral is analogous to a summation. I'm adding together a bunch of little products that are in dollars. The units of the integral have to be in dollars as well, because the integral sign doesn't affect the unit. This whole thing is in dollars. So if f of t is a financial flow in dollars per year, when you integrate it, it gives you the total amount of money that has flowed over that time interval. This would be the total amount of money that has flowed over the time interval in dollars. The time interval from A to B. That's what the integral represents. Again, the units come from thinking about the units of F of T and also thinking about the units of DT. Units of DT being the same as units of T. T is time in years. DT is like just a small amount of time that has elapsed, is what you pretend. And again, the integral sign is like adding those things. And if you're adding a bunch of quantities, it doesn't change the units. The higher the graph of f of t, the faster the money is flowing. The bigger the integral is going to be when, you, when your graph gets higher. The bigger the area under the curve. These are really, really fundamental things. As another example, it's a little harder to understand. Take a look at number three. F of X is measured in pounds and X is measured in feet, one of the units of the integral. I won't write it out by hand. It would be the units of F of X times the units of X. Pretend that's a multiplication there. Pounds times feet, foot pounds, what is that? 
That's actually a unit of energy. Foot pounds is actually a unit of energy. It's not the same as joules. You could convert it to joules. This kind of integral comes up when you're trying to find, for example, the work done by a force. If the force is varying, like it is, for example, with a, um, a mass on a spring, if you got a mass on a spring, you grab that mass and you just stretch the spring, you're doing force to move that mass a certain amount of distance. And it's not a constant force because you got to keep pulling it harder and harder when the spring gets longer and longer. So the force is varying. And if you integrate the force, you'll get the work done to move that mass, whose units would be units of energy. Standard units would be F of X would be in uh, Newtons and X would be in meters. And Newton meters is converts to joules. But here we're using non-standard units of pounds for the force and feet for, for the distance. And the units are still, still represent energy here, but it's, it's foot pounds, it's not the standard way to measure energy. Ooh. Take a look at this problem. We're trying, trying to expand our imaginations here. Imagination is essential in that. You gotta be able to use your imagination in the ways I'm saying to help you understand what's going on here. 21 says water is leaking out of a tank at a rate of R of T gallons per hour. R of T, look at the units, gallons per hour. That's a flow rate. How fast is the water flowing? The higher this graph is, the faster the water is flowing. At time zero, R of zero is up to two. Water's flowing out of the tank at a rate of two gallons every hour at that moment in time. The rate is not constant though, it's decreasing. What does that mean intuitively? How can you imagine that? Draw a picture. The water's coming out of the tank. Here's your tank. At a spout, the water's coming out. As time goes by, it's like somebody's shutting the valve. The water's flowing at a slower and slower rate. By the time you get to T equals, well, two point, what is that? 2.2 .2 or something. The rate is down below one gallon per hour. So it's, you got to imagine the water flowing out more and more slowly over time. And actually, I think you wouldn't have to actually close the drain to make it go out more slowly. I think it is a physical law as the water level goes down, it goes out more slowly. But R of T is a rate, it's a derivative in a sense, even though you don't see a prime. And if you integrate R of T, over the domain, whatever that happens to be, I guess it's zero to 2.2 .2 here. The units of this are in gallons per hour. The units for T and also DT is in hours. The hours cancel giving you units of gallons. The integral of the rate gives you the total amount of water that has leaked out of the tank over those 2.2 .2 hours. That's what it represents. I guess it's 2.25 over 2.25. That makes sense. When when the rate is faster, more water is going out every unit of time. The area does correspond to the amount of water, and the high, the bigger the area is, the more water has flowed out. You've got to be able to use your imagination. We'll need to continue emphasizing these things on Monday. And I also do want to emphasize the meaning of average value again, but that'll be for Monday. I have assigned reading from the first couple sections of chapter six. Section 6.2 is something you already know about, just indefinite integrals. 6.1 is a harder section because you're talking about integrals and antiderivatives at a more conceptual level. However, it is related to this example we did at the beginning of class today. Okay.
Make sure you study hard. We'll see you on Monday.